Ecclesia, let's pray. Dear God, I pray that as we open up your scripture today, that we will be reminded of the rhythms we live as a community in church, that we will be emboldened to live them more honestly and openly in our lives because of the words in your word. Amen. Well, Ecclesia, if you have joined us in this series, you know that we are in the middle of a series on the rhythms of Ecclesia. And actually, I shouldn't say middle, I'm closing out this series on the rhythms of Ecclesia. And the rhythms of Ecclesia are be real, be kind, be hospitable, seek beauty, seek God, and serve others. And one thing I love about this language of this being a rhythm in our church and not a rule is that this is not really a black and white type scenario, right? When you live into values, you do them in a messy way, often in an imperfect way, and that we live these as not doctrine and rule, but as a rhythm in our lives every day. As I was prepping for this sermon on being real, I had scheduled Wednesday as my sermon prep day. And I had the kids covered all day. My mom was going to watch them in the afternoon and my husband had them till 2.30. And um, the night before, our one-year-old was up all night with a fever. And I got a knock at the door early in the morning that mold removal was scheduled for that day. And a big wall in our house had been torn up. And it turns out it wasn't mold, it was just moisture, but there was banging and a tent in our living room. And I thought, how perfect that this is happening as I prepare a sermon on being real. Because the reality is, is that things are always coming up in our lives. Usually things we don't plan for. And that's not because we're doing something wrong, It's just part of being a real human being in the world. But if we ask the Bible the question, what does it mean to be real? I think we get some interesting answers. In Luke 12, it reads, the crowds at this time were packed in so tightly that the thousands of people were stepping on each other. Jesus spoke to his disciples, knowing that the crowds could overhear. And Jesus said, guard yourselves from the yeast that puffs up the Pharisees. Hypocrisy, false appearance, trying to look better than they really are. Nothing is covered up that won't be discovered. Nothing is hidden that won't be exposed. Whatever a person says in the dark will be published in the light of day, and whatever a person whispers in private rooms will be broadcast from the housetops. Ecclesia, in this text, it's literally saying, you know, whatever you do in private, it's going to be exposed. Do not live as the hypocrites do, but live more authentically and real. And what you need to know is that this word hypocrisy was taken from a Greek word that actually meant play acting. And in the Greek Greek theater scene at that time, um, people would wear masks. And so as Jesus and people are talking about this in the Bible and using the word hypocrisy, they're often referring to this idea that people are wearing masks and not revealing their true selves. And part of what what it means to be real is to acknowledge the many masks that we wear and have the courage to take them off. The Sermon on the Mount also uses this same Greek word for hypocrisy. And it reads, Likewise, when you pray, do not be as hypocrites who love to pray loudly at synagogue or on street corners, Their concern is to be seen by men. They have already earned their reward. When you pray, go into a private room, close the door, and pray unseen to your father, who is unseen. Then your father, who sees in secret, 
will reward you. And when you pray, do not go on and on excessively and strangely like the outsiders. They think their robosity will let them be heard by their deities. Do not be like them. Your prayers need not be labored or lengthy or grandiose. For your Father knows what you need before you ever ask him. You know, we've done a um, series on the Sermon on the Mount here at Ecclesia before, right? And in this passage, it's this idea that not only should you be real in your life, but most importantly, be real to God. Because God always knows the truth. You don't need to impress others or people or God with your beautiful prayers. But you just need to go to God honestly, Prayer is not about impressing God. It's about being real with God. And that's the type of realness and authenticity that we want in our community. We want our church to practice the rhythm of being real that says, hey, you don't have to put on a mask or dress a certain way or act a certain way to belong to this community at Ecclesia. In fact, as a rhythm of our culture, Let's make it a value to be real. Um, about a year ago, I was asked to pray in a small gathering, which for some reason is like my worst nightmare. I can do this, but ask me on the spot to come up with a prayer, and I get weird. And um, there was a group of about eight people. Half of them I knew well, and half of them I did not know well. And I remember thinking, should I say, like, thou art we about to share thy bounty? Or should I just talk like I normally talk? And I remember the prayer came out kind of weird, and I was in my head about it the rest of the night. Like, why did I say that? That was all ridiculous. And the reality is that part of being a real human is being kind of awkward sometimes. Right? We're all a little bit awkward. The other night, I was in the cul-de-sac with my neighbor, and our kids were playing. And um, her name's Jenna. She said, Jenna said, Erica, you seem really deep in thought. I guess I was distracted. And I said, Jenna, I am the opposite of deep in thought. I have no thoughts today. <laughs> I am thinking about absolutely nothing. I'm so tired, I'm hungry, and I have zero thoughts. And it was awkward, and we laughed about it. Or at the 90s party where we celebrated Ecclesia's 25th anniversary, um, I don't get out as much as I used to with little kids. Like, I don't go to parties. I don't speak to adults at nighttime after dinner. And um, actually, Holly, you're here today. I went up to Holly, who I really admire. She's like this amazing leader, in, influencer in Houston. I went up to Holly, and she was talking to G. And I'm like, these, these are two really cool people. I'm going to go talk to them. And I said to G, I said, um, G, I saw you were at church last week, and you brought somebody who hasn't been to church in a while, and, and I saw you guys. <laughs> and um, I totally interrupted a conversation. And I'm like, well, I'll... I'm, I'll see ya. I gotta I got go to the bathroom. And I'm like, why, why am I so weird? Should I go home? I think I went to the prayer room just to recoup. I'm like, Erica, you can do this. Being a human is awkward. Where am I in the sermon? This is awkward too. See, everything, everything is awkward. But you can bring your awkward self to God. You can bring your awkward self to your good friends. Ecclesia, since this text was written that we read today, something big happened. Jesus died, and he rose again. And we don't get to be perfect, none of us. But we get to be human. What a relief. Thank God. Literally, thank God. We don't have to be perfect. We can show up as our hypocritical selves, as we all are. 
I made a list of ways that I'm a hypocrite for this sermon. And mind you, the word hypocrisy was used a little bit differently. It was used kind of in the context of play acting and wearing a mask, but we use the word a little differently today. And the way we usually use it is when two values are in conflict with each other, we become a hypocrite. Like when we believe one thing, but we do another, that's often how we use the word hypocrite today. And so I came up with a list, which was quite easy to do, of some ways that I'm a hypocrite. I want to be a minimalist and fight climate change, but my habits of consumption are not in line with what I say I care about. I told my son last week that we do not use what our pediatrician calls lazy words. And that same day, he called me out for using the S word. Every time our house is clean, I proclaim, I will keep it this way. And I truly believe my delusions. Never once has that been true. I preach grace, both giving it to others and myself. And when I get in my car and drive to the west side in about 20 minutes, I will rehearse everything I said wrong in this sermon. I tell others that there is zero, no shame in struggling with a mental illness. And when I was in high school, I would sit in the parking lot of my psychologist's office so that nobody would see me in the waiting room. Thankfully, we've come a long way the past 20 years, and now I love chatting it up in my therapist's office. I value being real and authentic, and I bleach my hair bright blonde and apply sunless tanner almost every day. Go figure. I could see, I could go on and on. And the truth is, is that we hold values in our life and they're often in conflict with one another. We don't live out our lives, our values, our ideas perfectly, not because we're horrible people or doing everything wrong, but because we are real human beings. And part of our calling is to be real. I love reading Paul because Paul was such a human. He was so real and honest. You know, Paul writes, listen, I can't explain my actions. Here's why. I'm not able to do the things I want. And at the same time, I do the things I despise. I know that in me, that is in my fallen human nature, there is nothing good. I can will myself to do something good, but that does not help me carry it out. I can determine that I am going to do good, but I don't do it. Instead, I end up living out the evil that I decided not to do. If I end up doing the exact thing I pledged not to do, I am no longer doing it because sin has taken up residence in me. Ecclesia, the people that were writing this Bible and wrestling through what it means to follow God, they were human too. Ancient people had the same value struggles that we have today. And I don't find that as a problem in the Bible. I find that as comfort, that the Bible is there to embrace all of our humanity. And the reality is, is that we all have skeletons in our closet. You know, as I was working on this sermon, my office is in a storage closet upstairs. And I kid you not, I realized I did not put out my Halloween decoration yet because I saw this and I thought, how perfect. There's literally a skeleton in my closet <laughs> as I write a sermon on being real and I can hear the mold people downstairs chopping away. And I don't think vulnerability or being real means that you have to share every skeleton in your closet to everyone, right? There's something to be said about performative vulnerability. I don't think 
every secret of your life needs to be announced from the rooftop. Although if that's your calling, that's great. That's not for everyone. In fact, I often get praised on the side when I talk about my past with addiction and 12-step programs as being courageous or vulnerable. But I have to be honest, I don't have any shame about that, especially after going to 12-step meetings. So that's not vulnerable for me to share anymore. I only shared it when it became less vulnerable. But other things in my life might feel more vulnerable. See, part of being real does not mean announcing all the skeletons. It just means showing up in spaces and being who you are. And that is easier said than done. When I um, first started dating my husband, um, it was in college, and he asked me on a date, our first date, to go study at the library. So studious we were. And I said yes, and we went to the library, and he was working on a paper on race and ethnicity. And I liked to write in college. Don't give me a math problem or a physics equation, but I do like to write. So I, trying to impress him on this first date, said, I can help you with that paper. I took his Acer computer, and I opened up that Word document, and I started reading it. And as I was editing it, it vanished. The paper was lost. We could find this paper nowhere. I didn't touch anything. I, I was just in a Word document, and he started to get a little panicked. I was really panicking. I thought, this is the worst first date ever. Oddly enough, this is just a side detail, at the time, my husband was a sociology major at the University of Wisconsin, and Dr. Ruth Lopez Turley was at Wisconsin teaching a class on race and ethnicity. So there is a good chance that this paper was actually for Dr. Ruth Lopez Turley's class. And she's a sister of ours here at Ecclesia. That's a random fact, but it's, it's a cool one. So I lose this paper. I go back to my roommates and I let them know this date with Garrett Graham, it did not go well. I talked the entire time. He didn't even talk that much. He didn't seem into me. I lost his paper. It's going to be awkward the next time I see him on campus. And I got a text later from Garrett that night. And he said, I had a wonderful time with you. And I thought, what? That's you having a good time? I was trying to impress him. I didn't feel like he was trying to impress me. And I think part of the reason I thought Garrett Graham was so hot is that he didn't try to impress me. He didn't brag. He didn't make sure I knew who he was. He just kind of showed up as himself in a way that inspired me. See, as humans, we know when people are being real with us. We can feel it. The New York Times recently did an experiment. They published two 1,000-word essays. One was written by a famous novelist, and the other was written by ChatGPT. i got to say that, ChatGPT. And um, you may have listened to this daily episode. I think it was a podcast also. But people that read both essays or listened to both essays, almost unanimously, they had a favorite. And it was the essay written by a human being. And I'm not saying that AI isn't going to catch up to the creativity and the wittiness of the human mind. It might, and in some ways it has. But there was something that the readers and hearers could distinguish, that there was a soul behind one of the essays. And there didn't seem to be a soul behind the other. And I think a lot of that is just because we can sense what is real in the world. We know it when we hear it and see it. 
It's intangible. It's hard to describe, but it's a feeling. And being real has never been so hard as it is in the age of social media. Social media is not just used to project things that are not real, but it also encourages us to be less real so that we can belong to certain social groups. You know, I'm 36, and I can tell you that I've been in my 30s when I've said the sentence out loud to Garrett in my living room. Aw, they're all together. I wish I was invited. From Instagram. Right? I mean, this is, this is not a middle school girl thing. This is a human thing. And while that feeling is normal for all of us to feel a little left out once in a while, what I worry is that we will become less of who we are to belong to some people as opposed to our Lord. And I think one of the greatest challenges of social media is that we are called to belong to something so much greater than the intoxicating dopamine that comes from belonging to a social group. It's not easy, but I believe it's doable when we're living in these rhythms well. And Ecclesia, it's often in our hurt, in our struggles, where we stumble upon our ordinary and real humanity. The story of Doubting Thomas reminds us of this. It reads, May each of you be at peace. He drew close to Thomas, and Jesus said, Reach out and touch me. See the punctures in my hands? Reach out your hand and put it to my side. Leave behind your faithlessness and believe. Thomas was filled with emotion. He said, you are the one true God, the Lord of my life. Thomas, you have faith because you have seen me, said Jesus. Blessed are all those who never see me, and yet they still believe. Right? In this story, Thomas believed not because Jesus performed miracles and walked on water, but because he had open wounds. And Thomas could see his humanity alongside his divinity. In so many ways, the story of Christianity is about coming together, not in our awesomeness, but in our brokenness. It's why we break bread to remember that in these human bodies that are broken, we can find everlasting wholeness if we come together, not as perfect, but as broken, as hypocritical, as contradictions, because we have a savior, so you don't have to be one. You know, I love communion for that reason, participating in it, taking it. And as I work on my sermons, I have this little box by my computer, and it has some little communion cups and a little wine-stained bottle. And this is the exact little briefcase that my grandfather used to take to hospitals and to visit people when he was a reverend in a small town called New Glarus, Wisconsin. And Reverend Weirwell would show up with this box 70 years ago and have people break bread, drink wine, and remember the truth of who we are. And I need this reminder, probably for the same reason that you do, and that's that so much has changed in our world. Right? The news cycle is always changing. Things are never ending. It's confusing. But the one thing that never changes 
is that on Sunday morning, we come together and we break bread. And we do it because we are not called to be awesome or God ourselves, but we are called to be broken and real. What a relief. Let me pray with you, Ecclesia. Dear God, I pray that we will find new ways to practice the rhythm of being real in our life. That despite the awkwardness and contradictions that come from being human, that we will know a better way because we trust the path of your son who came and died and rose again so that we could leave, live freely in the light of you. In your name we pray, amen.